So in this clip, I'm going to go through the hypothesis testing slides. That's the last six slides of the uh, introduction to inference uh, lecture. Uh, here on, on slide 11, that's the last one we covered in the lecture. I'll replicate that here again. What we're seeing that the five essential steps that will appear in every hypothesis test, every hypothesis test. Okay, and um, let me. Well, we'll leave them here, but we'll get back to them with uh, with an example. I just very briefly revise. We we need to set hypotheses. Okay, and these two hypotheses, the null and the alternative hypothesis, they will between them they will split all possibilities. So what do I mean with this? Here we are thinking we're having some random variable x, so we have some random variable x that is distributed. Well, we don't perhaps we don't even know how that is distributed, but it will have a mean mu of x. Okay, and it may have other parameters, standard deviations, skewness perhaps. It doesn't really matter. All we are interested in is this mean. And now we are hypothesizing what size that mean is. And let's say our null hypothesis is that it is 21. And then the alternative is that it's unequal to 21. And that covers all possibilities. Whatever size the mean is, which is unknown, so th this one we don't know, it is unknown, whatever value it has, it will fall in one of these categories. And that's what I mean with split all possibilities. You have to cover all possibilities. Then we are setting our significance level. Now this this is a very important this is a very important step. Okay, it's what I say here the probability of rejecting H naught if it was correct. So we have to acknowledge the the following. I usually use a little table to do this. We are thinking of when we do a hypothesis test. Uh, we will eventually make a decision, okay? And we will either say that H naught is okay, or we will reject H naught. Then the truth will be one of two things. The truth will be either represented by H naught or by HA, the alternative hypothesis. So if the truth is H naught and we decide that H naught is okay, so we are in this little box, that is great. Then we made a, a correct decision. Also, if HA is the, alter the alternative hypothesis represents the truth and we reject H naught, how we do that we will see later, then we're okay as well. That means there are two types of mistakes we can make. And since we don't know what the truth is, you know, well, we don't well, we could make both mistakes potentially. If H naught is the truth, so if indeed the mean for instance is twenty one and we reject H naught, this is what we call a type 1 error. If however HA represents the truth and we do not reject H0, this is what we call a type 2 error. Now what we, since we don't know the truth, we basically have to control both of these. What we do in, sig in a significance in a hypothesis test is we control the probability of making this mistake. Okay, the probability of making a type one error conditional on H naught being the truth that is equal to alpha. So that is how we set our alpha. We have to decide what probability we find acceptable here. So in here the, um, the, equi the equivalence to the court case if our null hypothesis is that the defendant is innocent 
And the question is, with what probability should we expect to convict that innocent um, defendant? So with what probability would we reject that he's innocent, although in truth he is innocent? Now in that case, clearly we would want to have a really, really small probability. Okay, Even 5%, which we often use, is possibly in that case not really an acceptable probability. So you need to set that significance level depending on how grave the consequences are of making a type 1 error. Usually in statistics we are not dealing with such uh, grave consequences as sticking someone in sale. We often use an alpha of 0 0.05 but 0 0.01 is very common as well. So then next step is we need to devise a test statistic. Now th this guy, this depends on the problem. Okay, so this is very problem dependent. Remember, this is really a um, a general outline what hypothesis tests do. If we test for a population mean, as we will in our example, then we use something which is called a t-test. In fact, that t-test will look very much like our standardization formula. But we'll see that on the next slide. So I'll fill that in a little later. And then we need to know what we call what its sampling distribution is. In if we want to test for mu for mu x, we will use a t -t that t-test is possibly not surprising that it will use a sample mean. Okay, we will somehow use the sample mean in here, and that means we need to know what the sampling distribution of this sample mean is. That will tell us what the sampling distribution of the t-test is. Just a little bit more detail later. We will also need to find a certain critical value. So we will need to write down what is called a decision rule. Okay, where we say, and we do that before we do our calculations, where we say reject the null hypothesis if our t test, our calculated test statistic, is takes a certain value relative to the critical value, and that now depends on the hypothesis. So. Uh, so if the t-test is either smaller or larger than some critical value, that depends on the example. Okay, so I'll leave that general here. Then in the fourth step, we do our calculation. So that's how we calculate the t-test and then we will compare it to that critical value. And that comparison is start done in step five and that will then tell us whether we reject h naught or not. So this is the, the general rule, uh, sorry, the general outline. Let's see whether we can fill this with a little bit more life by following up our example of testing for the uh, average age in our, in our class. So here's the next slide. So at the core of the testing strategy is this test statistic. Okay, so we need to, to find, we need to use our sample data to somehow get sufficient information on uh, on our uh, on our hypothesis. So let me just replicate the hypothesis here we had. The hypothesis was that the population mean is equal to 21 and the alternative that it was unequal to 21. So as I said before we are going to use sample information so in particular the sample the sample mean and as we discussed before we want to do that because that sample mean is a random variable itself and it is drawn from a distribution that has a mean itself 
we call that mu x bar and as it turns out that mean was equal to mu x so that's why we can use that x bar to draw inference on here so and here's the test statistic and you just have to know that the sample mean x bar minus mu x that mu x that value here will come from the null hypothesis so in our example that will be 21 divided by sx the sample standard deviation from our sample okay we know how to calculate that we know how to calculate the sample standard deviation and then divided by n where that uh, that n is the sample size I'm not quite sure I said that anyway oh yeah it's here okay n is the sample size I'll divide it by square root n sorry so why does that test statistic give, give us information well it's important to understand that what sort of information is it that what sample mean would give us the most support for the null hypothesis well that would be if we were to indeed get a sample mean of 21 what type of t value would we then get we would get 21 minus 21 so we'd have zero here in the numerator so whatever is in the denominator it doesn't matter the test statistic would be zero if we had sample mean equal to the hypothesized uh, population mean so that would be evidence for h naught so what type of evidence would speak to reject h naught so or evidence in favor of H A. Okay, what would that be? That would be X bars either much larger than 21 or X bars much smaller. than 21. So that is the sort of evidence which would make us move away from H0 to HA. The question is just what is much larger and what is much smaller. So how far away from 21 do we have to go? And that is what this test statistic standardizes. And I said before this is sort of looks a little bit like a standardization formula because we have X bar minus this is a random variable minus its mean y minus its mean because mu x is equal to mu x bar divided by usually we divide by the standard deviation here we divide by sx divided by square root n it actually turns out and that's just an aside I'll just I'll just say that um, that entire bit here sx divided by square root n that actually turns out to be equal to the standard deviation of x bar okay so that is really the standardization formula x bar minus its mean divided by its standard deviation but you don't need to know that but you need to know the formula so this is the sort of evidence we need if we have x bars either much larger than 21 then we get something very positive here divided by a certain value but the, la the further or the larger x bar, the further away from 21, the larger the t stat will get. Equally, if we get x bars that are much smaller than 21, we get a negative t stat, and we will, the further it moves away from 21, the more negative that will get. So it turns out that if our t stat is sufficiently different from zero we will interpret this as evidence against H0 because that corresponds to these cases. So this leaves us with, with one task. How do we decide how do we decide what is sufficiently different? different and for this we need to know we need to know what 
the distribution of t stat would be if h naught was true. Okay, if h naught was true, what would the distribution be? And then we will say if the actual t stat we get is sufficiently unlikely to have come from that distribution, then we decide that h naught should be rejected. Now, remember we said that x bar is a random variable, and that means if that is on the right hand side of the calculation for the t stat, that means that t stat is a random variable itself. So it will have a distribution. So let me copy in the next slide. So what I've done here is the following. To answer this question, we need to know what the distribution of the t stat would be if h naught was true. I did the following. I took a sample of size 40, n equals 40, okay, and that would be our example later. And I took that sample from a normal distribution with population mean 21. Okay, so I've said I have a, let's say, ages of, you know, everyone in the class, and I made sure in my artificial example, okay, so this one here is an artificial example, or a simulation, that in, in, indeed the true mean was 21. So here I know the truth, okay? So known truth, that's why it is artificial. So from that distribution I took a sample of 40. Now of course, each individual, so x bar from here, and I calculated x bar from here. That is, in general, unequal to 40, unless I was very lucky, okay, but in general that's going to be unequal to 40, then I also calculated the sample standard deviation from the sample, and then I calculated my t-stat where I used mu x equals to 21, okay, so here I substituted 21 for mu x x bar from was the sample average as x came from the sample divided by square root n that is square root 40. But then I did the whole thing a thousand times. Okay, I do that a thousand times. That means I get 1000 t stats. And they all take different values because for all 1000 samples I get different x bars and different s x's. And then I plot a histogram of these t stats. Okay, and this is the histogram I get. Okay, so I plotted this as a discrete one, but clearly this is a continuous random variable. So I discretized to plot the histogram, I discretized it. So, now what is this distribution? This is what we call the sampling distribution of the t-test. Let's again review how did we get that. I assumed I know the truth. The population mean is 21. Okay, so that was the mu x here. I drew one sample of 40, calculated the sample mean, the sample standard deviation, and then I could calculate that t-stat. Then I repeated this 1,000 times, and I get 1,000 t-stats. And all these t-stats come from a situation where our population mean is indeed 21, and we are calculating that t-stat as if we are testing is the mean 21. Okay, remember in that t-stat, that value here, that value that does come from the null hypothesis, whatever we decide we want to test. So, and what I get is this distribution. Now, how does this look like? Now, indeed, this does look 
again quite pretty, quite beautiful. A, a smooth approximation to this or possibly look something like this. And now look at this, we have values, we have a few values smaller than negative 2 and larger than plus 2 but not very many. And we have a symmetric, more or less a symmetric distribution averaged at approximately zero here. Now where do we know this from? Now it turns out that this guy is basically very, very close to what distribution we know as standard normal distribution. Okay? And this is you just have to take from me. Okay, so it turns out that if H naught is true, which is the case in our case, if H naught is true, then the T stat, how is it distributed? It is distributed like this. This is valid really for sufficiently large samples. So for sufficiently large samples. And 40 is usually enough, okay? So everything above 40 is usually enough. So this is now a beautiful result because now remember what we said is in the end we need to know what is sufficiently far away from zero. Now that we have a normal distribution we can actually you know calculate how likely is it that we get a value of for instance negative 2.5 if the null hypothesis is true. Okay, because we know we can look at the normal distribution. So we can use we can calculate these probabilities. So what we so far established what is what a distribution of t-tests would look like if the null hypothesis was true. That means we now have the tool to decide what is a sufficiently a t test sufficiently different from zero. You can see this distribution is centered around zero. So let's go to the next slide here. So and the key is now to understand that only if our sample was to produce a t-test that is very unlikely to have come from this distribution, then we would reject H0. That's the main idea. Here we have this distribution again. We can see likely values are these values around zero. Okay? In fact, let's say values between negative 1.5 and plus 1.5 for sure. It depends now on how far we want to go out in the tail. Now indeed we have learned from a normal distribution that about 95% of observations will be between approximately negative 2 and plus 2. So let's say we set our alpha to 5%. Okay, that was the type 1 probability, probability of rejecting an incorrect uh, sorry, of rejecting a correct null hypothesis. So, what does that mean? That means that if we again have our smooth normal distribution looking here, if we want to make a um, mistake of rejecting the correct null hypothesis only in 5% of cases, and we'll say, you know, we'll are happy to make these mistakes on both ends of the distribution for two for very large t's and small t statistics. What we want is we want to find that values that cut off 2.5% in each tail. Now we know these values are indeed actually I should have it a bit further over here and over here because these values are as we know negative 1.6 and 1.96. So here is therefore our decision rule. We will reject at an alpha of 5%. Okay, We set that probability. The researcher has to set that 
we will reject H0 if our T test is smaller than negative 1.96, so it's to the left of here, or larger than plus 0.196, because these values would be relatively extreme if the null hypothesis was true. So let's apply that to our to a particular example. We'll go to our next slide. So our next slide. So let's say we have a sample of size 40. Okay, that's what we used in the simulations as well. And let's say our sample average is 21.487 and the sample standard deviation 2.240. You know how to calculate these values, that's all from descriptive statistics. Then we calculate our T stat, okay? Sample average, or actually what I should do is I'll just replicate the null and the alternative hypotheses. Okay, the null hypothesis was that mu x was equal to 21 and the alternative that it was unequal to 21. So, that means we have our sample average, okay, that appears here, that's the x, x bar, that appears here, 21.487, minus mu x, that is this value here, the value from the null hypothesis, okay, the equal value here. That's this one. Divided by Sx, that's the sample standard deviation. So this guy here, that appears here again, the sample standard deviation. Divided by square root of 40. Okay, that 40 is our sample size. What we get is 1.374. Now let's compare that to our, so this one now, we got to compare to our, what we call decision rule. This is our decision rule. Okay, so is 1.374 smaller than 1.96? No. Is it larger than 1.96? No. That means this condition isn't given, and that means we cannot reject H0, because remember, we said we reject H0 if either of these conditions is given. So, therefore, we conclude this. We do not reject H0. So, this is how a test for a population mean works. We can apply the technique of hypothesis testing also to hypothesis, which we call two-sided hypothesis. Let me just copy the next slide in here, but let's stick to this slide for the time being. These hypotheses here We said in null hypothesis that the value was equal to something, and the alternative was unequal, so either larger or smaller. We call this, because we are looking for larger or smaller, we call, the, call this a two-tailed test. Okay, So we are looking sort of in both tails. When we looked at what we call the critical values, we were dividing this 5% probability into both tails. So, now let's look at this case. We can also test hypothesis, and uh, very often this is the type of hypothesis we are interested in, in what we call one-sided hypothesis. So here we have the null hypothesis that the uh, population mean is smaller or equal to 21, and the alternative hypothesis is then the opposite to that. That means that the population mean is larger than 21. The equal sign, the equal sign is always in the null hypothesis, is always in H0, sometimes by itself as above, and sometimes together with either the small or the larger sign, but the equal sign is always in here. But again, we have divided the space of possibilities into two bits, into two parts. So, how would our how would our procedure change? Let's briefly go back to our to our six 
our six steps. Okay, so we set our hypothesis differently. We still need to uh, to set the significance level. Let's leave that at five uh, percent. We will now again have to set a test statistic. We use exactly the same test statistic. We are testing again a hypothesis on a population mean. We will stick with the t-test. And the sampling distribution of the t-test is exactly the same. Where the difference now comes in is in finding the critical value. So we'll sort of hook back in at, at this stage. So we, we have set our one-sided hypothesis. Just for completeness sake, we again state our alpha. Okay, so we'll again say we are happy with a 5% probability of rejecting a correct null hypothesis. Now we know that the sampling distribution of our t-test looks like this. Let me also just replicate the t-test here. The t-test is going to be x bar minus mu x divided by sx divided by square root n. So the sampling distribution distribution of the t-test is going to be exactly the same as before. It's going to be the standard normal distribution. So we have the t-test standard normal we know is going to be centered around zero and we know we have about 95% around plus minus two standard deviations. So now we will be, well, where do we find evidence against the null hypothesis? Let us write this down. Evidence, evidence against H0 would be the following. We, the H0 says the population mean could be equal to 21 or smaller. So if our sample mean is either smaller than 21 or equal to 21, that is certainly not going to be evidence against the null hypothesis. Evidence against the null hypothesis is going to be sample means that will be larger than 21. So evidence is going to be x bars um, much larger than 21. Okay, and what will that lead to? That will lead to t tests much larger than zero. Why is that? Here, our 21, we can already uh, let's complete that. Okay, here we will have 21. Where does that come from? That 21, it again comes from the null hypothesis. Okay. Here we have that equal bit in here, equal to 21, that will go in here. So when we have sample averages larger than 21, we get positive values here. The denominator is always going to be positive, so that means we will get t-tests, positive t-tests. And the larger the x-bar, the larger the t-tests. So the question is, we're for very large t-tests, we want to reject the null hypothesis. But now we know we could get fairly large t-tests, even if the null hypothesis is true, because this distribution, remember, was produced assuming h naught is true. So what are the 5%, 5%, most extreme t values we could get if the null hypothesis was true. In other words, we find, want to find that value in that distribution that cuts off 5% of the tail. Okay, We are now only looking for large t-tests, so we are only looking at the, on this right-hand tail. Now if you go, uh, if there's 5% here, in here, we will have 95%. And you can go to the standard normal table and see what value that is. And it turns out that value is 1.645. So that means our decision rule is going to be 
reject h naught if the t test is larger than 1.645. Okay, because if you get a t test that is larger than 1.645, the probability that we would get that if the null was true would be less than 5%. Okay, value larger than 1.645, the probability to get a value like this or larger is less than 5%. And this is our cutoff. We determined that with the alpha here. We had to set that. Okay, so now let's go back to our sample information and see what we have. We had a sample mean of 21487. So we had. 21, let's say we had the same sample, okay, I'm using the same information, I just changed the hypothesis, divided by 2.240, divided by square root n, well, it's exactly the same value, so of course we get exactly the same, uh, the same t stat, so look, we have 1.374, the question is, is that larger than 1.645 the answer is no and therefore we cannot so do not reject h0 so this was the procedure if we had what we call a one-sided test a one-sided test and of course you could imagine having a test with smaller here. Okay, One could have a null hypothesis larger than equal and the alternative smaller than. Then this whole argument turns around, then we would be looking in the left-hand tail and we would reject H0 if the t-test is smaller than, say, negative 1.645. Okay? So it all depends on this hypothesis. So these were all tests for the population mean. Just a few more, uh, a few more additional notes on, on generalization. So here we followed through with the generalization for one-sided tests. Um, sometimes, for instance, in the next section, we will test different things. For instance, we will test we will test whether two uh, discrete random variables are related to each other. We will then need different test statistics and different test statistics will have potentially different sampling distributions. There, there's more than one test that has a normal sampling distribution, but some test statistics have a different distribution. We'll account, encounter a different distribution in the next step. But whenever we have a hypothesis test, the five steps we used will be, uh, will be followed. So, this was my extra discussion on uh, hypothesis tests. I hope this was useful.